Hello and welcome to another panel of the Dark Hedges International Film Festival. My name is Joe McElroy and this evening we're joined by a very special guest. Uh, she is the writer director of 2018's The Devil's Doorway amongst uh, several other short films and she's also a recent recipient of the Academy Gold Fellowship Grant for Women and uh, I'm very delighted to introduce now Ashlyn Clark. Hello. Hi, Ashlyn. Hi. <laughs> yeah so uh, basically Ashlyn I suppose sort of just start with the beginning what uh what sort of mainly influenced you to you know embark in a career in filmmaking as such Gosh, well i uh, i think probably the first time it ever occurred to me was when i was about i'm the youngest in a in a catholic family so there's you know like by the time you come along the parental restrictions are relaxed a little bit so i got to see uh, the Exorcist and Nightmare on Elm Street when I was very young and um, I loved every minute of it and I remember in particular watching Nightmare on Elm Street and really trying to figure out how they did it because I knew that it was created by someone and because I was only seven uh, I had no concept of a director or anything like that I thought basically that the actors were just playing kind of like you know a child might with their friends but I remember thinking I would really love to do that that looks like so much fun to create that whole world so that's the first time it occurred to me. My father was really into films. Um, he had a, a 16 mil camera and he would make uh, mostly just, you know, like he was, he was a working class man. He had a real job, but he enjoyed filming things. And um, sometimes I was involved with that. Sometimes we would film like little skits or things like that. And so I always was interested in it. And then I went to film school. Well, when I say I went to film school, I studied film at Queen's. And at that time, it was uh, Queen's of Belfast, obviously. And at that time, it was film studies. And it was very much an academic course. There was very little in the way of practical filmmaking involved with it. There was kind of a nod towards it. I think there was a camera somewhere that you could sign out if you, nobody else had it. And you have to figure out kind of how to work it yourself. But it was really focused on more the academic side. And, uh, but I did make some films there. And um, so I guess in a way, I mean, uh, I, I kind of, all, what I'm trying to say is I kind of always wanted to do it, but I didn't exactly know what it was or how I would do it until I was an adult, uh, until I was actually studying film and then thinking, uh, oh, this is what I want to be. This is what I want to do. I want to make films, start making shorts. Then um, I made a short documentary that was broadcast on UTV a number of times. <laughs> I heard actually they played it again a couple of years ago. So this is... 2004 I think when I made that and they made, they played it quite a lot over the years and uh, on the back of that uh, which won a small award I got picked up by a production company and I worked in TV for a number of years and um, basically took a very roundabout route to doing to doing what I wanted to do when I was seven so I uh, worked in TV and production and research and development I uh, got offered a job in Channel 4 which I decided to turn down in the end because I wasn't writing and making films. I went to New York and did a diploma in screenwriting to kind of focus on that again. Um, and then come back to Northern Ireland, worked in theatre. I'm always dancing around what I actually wanted to do, but I learned so much by going the long way. I think so much of what I learned was really um, applicable to narrative feature filmmaking, which is what I wanted to do in the first place. So it was a long route, but a useful one. Oh yeah, you got there in the end. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, and just uh, looking at the you know the films that you've done yourself, um, you know, in terms of the short films that you've done, uh, the one that really stands out for me, and uh, when I was just preparing for this interview, was uh, Childer. Uh, so, can you tell us a bit about you know the sort of influences behind that there? Uh, because it's sort of a story of uh, you know an introverted and overprotective uh, mother uh, who fears the children at the bottom of her garden as such. Yeah, um, it's a funny one. I wouldn't call her overprotective because she actually does spoiler alert. She kills her, kills her <laughs> child, yeah. but, which is the opposite of protective. But um, I was, I think I was, well, first of all, what actually inspired that was uh, just after the recession. Do you remember the recession in about 2007 or so? Mm -hmm. um, there were loads of like really nice houses that you could rent fairly cheaply uh, in nice suburban parts of Belfast because people bought them to turn into apartments, ran out of money. I got one of these houses that was on the Earlswood Road in East Belfast, which if you know Belfast is a really nice street. And um, it, was a, it was a lovely house 
uh, the guy who bought it just couldn't afford to do anything with it and he rented it to me for cheap if I would paint it and kind of fix it up a little bit so I did that I was a single parent at the time I mean technically I still am but my son's grown up now and um, it was just the two of us living in this house and it had a big garden all around and quite far in off the road and next door the guy, same guy bought the house next door also and the people who moved in there uh, probably under the same kind of conditions were uh, there was a lot of kids I don't even know if they were all from the same uh, family, but there was like, there must've been 10 of them, all under 10 years old. Uh, the parents I never really saw, and I thought that, I got the feeling that the kids didn't have a good home life. Um, they would come around to our house all the time, not our house, but our garden. A lot of the time they were just being kids, just playing and it was okay, but sometimes they were a wee bit scary. Um, and I would have to give them boundaries and say like, get off the roof, stuff like this, they'd climb up on the shed roof and things like that, you know. outside my back garden which is very uh, which was very cut off and very quiet and one of the kids was just randomly standing there wearing nothing but a pair of jeans and he was only about three years old and just in it for a split second I just had this feeling what if he was a ghost I don't know why it even occurred to me and I just felt my blood run cold and it's like we just looked at each other for a second and then he just ran off uh, the next day the kids all came to my house knocked on the door the whole trip of them and they had a frog, uh, one of the little girls had a frog in her hand and then uh, she said, you don't have a boyfriend? Because they'd noticed that I didn't have a man around the house. You don't have a boyfriend? And I said, no. And then she said, well, if you kiss him, this frog, he'll be a prince. And, uh, I, and then one of the little boys said, our sister kissed a frog once, but she's dead now. And I just thought this was such a mildly threatening. I mean, it's not really, they're just being kids. Yeah. But, but context of, uh, a story I felt that that could be really sort of weirdly threatening and uh, that's kind of what what started me thinking about that story so that's where it came from in terms of influences I think I love repulsion uh, Polanski mm -hmm. repulsion and um, I love the way he just examines the kind of unraveling of this really strange character uh, this really introverted person and gives us so much of her interior life without a lot of dialogue with other characters and um and also i love folk horror uh so and this felt folk horror ish to me this kind of these weird kids practically living in the garden felt mm -hmm. like a folk horror beginning so that's where the idea for them for doing masks and everything came from uh so it was kind of a, a, a bunch of things that came together and then i'd seen uh uh, Claire Fox, who was the production designer on the film, I'd seen that she made masks like this. For, she did photography, kind of, um, you know, art photography. And I'd seen like a really oversized kind of kitten mask that she'd made for a photograph. And I said, Claire, you know, do you want to work in this film and make me a bunch of these masks? And uh, that's, that's what happened. And yeah, that was the, okay. the longer that story probably. Yeah, well, th that's the thing about the masks as well. They sort of remind me, you know, when I was a child, there was uh, like murmurs, I think they're called. They had like a wicker sort of Mummer, basket mask. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, yeah, it sort of reminded me of that. And, um, you know, it was just that imagery. It, it sort of just made me feel quite uneasy in that there. And it's like you said, it, um, you know, it really helped get across, you know, this... Uh, uh, this woman who's sort of unraveling, you know, the more she sees the children and, uh, you know, the more sort of freedom the, the young boy in it sort of gets. You know, he wants to dress up a certain way at school and she's like, oh, no, I, I don't want you to do that. And um, that's another thing. He was actually absolutely brilliant in it, that young actor. Um, oh, it's just fantastic. Um, where, where did you find him? Like, he just seemed uh... perfect. Uh, that was um, Luke. I'm trying to think where. I think it was um, Margaret McGoldrick who produced Childer. I think she mentioned Luke and he had done something that she had been mm. involved with previously. And I can't for the life of me remember now what exactly it was. But um, he's basically the only kid we even spoke to. So he, he did audition for it, but it was like, he was definitely going to get it. He was just so good. Yeah. And he did a, he did a really brilliant job. Oh yeah. And absolutely shows. Um, 
But I suppose uh, just moving away from children and the sorry children, um, and then towards the devil's doorway. Then, um, how did that project come together? Uh, really? Well, as I say, I had worked in theatre for quite a long time, um, and at some point, I mean, and in theatre, I was doing a lot of stuff. You know, now and then I would do visuals and things like that as well. So I was still shooting things, but I wasn't making films. And uh, I decided to submit some stuff to Northern Ireland Screen. I made a couple of shorts. I had a feature script picked up for the New Talent Focus, New Writers Focus uh, that year. And then the producer of The Devil Story, Martin Brennan, um, had an idea. It was just, it was really like a nebulous thing at this point. It was, um, there was no script or anything. He wanted to make a found footage film set in a Magdalene laundry. So he was thinking kind of like, uh, say, Grave Encounters or Blair Witch, um, contemporary, get a bunch of young people, stick them into an abandoned spooky place, scare them. Record it all on GoPro. That was his, his notion. And uh, the reason that he spoke to me, he spoke to other directors too in Northern Ireland, uh, as I understand. But the reason that he spoke to me was because he was looking for someone specifically who was co comfortable working with improv actors. And Northern Ireland Screen told him to speak to me because I'd done a lot of theatre. So that was kind of how we met. But um, when he pitched this, when he said this to me, uh, my initial response was simultaneously, I was really excited by this idea, but also really, really not. Because I thought there's, this could so easily get really bad. This could so easily go really wrong. Yeah. When I was working in TV, I'd done a lot of research on Magdalene Laundries for a documentary that for whatever reason, never ended up happening. But uh, while I was working for the production company I was working for at the time, I spent a lot of time researching this documentary, spoke to women who had been in these laundries. The last one closed in 1996. So there were women who at that point, they were in their thirties who'd been in these places. Um, I spoke to people in the States who were born, they were able to trace their roots to Ireland, to Michael and Laundry, but they didn't know who their mother was, all of that stuff. So I knew a lot about the workings of these places. And, uh, and also how much damage they left. Yeah. So I thought this is, a re this is really fertile territory for a horror film because I think the best horror films um, dig into social trauma and present social trauma to us in a, in a way that is, feels safer for us to begin unpacking it, I guess. And I yeah. thought that has the potential for that, but it also could be really exploitative. So in order to do this the right way, I think you need to be really careful and um, I suggested that instead of doing a contemporary uh, found footage like that, um, set in 1960, uh, get into the real, when these places were full of people, get into the heart of the human drama and use that, use the horror as a metaphor to explore that drama rather than just a bouncing off point for scares. You know what I mean? And also yeah. because I watch a lot of horror films I have done my whole life, uh, I've seen, I see so many found footage films on streaming services. The genre, subgenre gets a really bad rap because one reason in particular, it's very cheap to make it compared to other methods of filmmaking. So that means you get a glut of content and anytime you get a glut of content, you're going to get it overwhelmed by bad stuff. So because there's been so many bad films, it has a bad rap. And I thought you put this, if it's contemporary, especially if you shoot it on GoPro or something, you put it on a, a streaming service and people will just flick past it. It needs to aesthetically sit outside of that. So that killed two birds at one stone. Set it in 1960, get to the heart of human drama. It also looks aesthetically different because uh, you shoot on 16 millimeter film and then you have more of a chance of people actually engaging with what you've made. So I, I strongly felt that that's how he should make it. I thought he probably wouldn't give me another call because he wanted to make a different film, but he did and he said he liked that and that's what we did. That's what we made. Yeah. So an ordinary spring funded it. Uh, completely pretty much um, and when I first met him I think it was like May or June and we got the green light before September and then the film ha had to be shot principal photography had to be shot by the uh, middle of December so there was no time no script so the yeah. whole process was very uh, concentrated and when I first met him I thought this is a cool idea potentially if you do it like this, but I also thought this will never happen. <laughs> no, yeah. because so many film projects don't, sadly, they just don't end up happening. And uh, having worked in TV for a longish time, I knew that. But lo and behold, this is the one that actually took and off it went. And that's, that's how it came to be. 
Well, uh, just going back to what you were saying there in terms of, you know, your approach to the film and how you, uh, you know, you know, I thought I thought it was a great idea making it a period piece, uh, just like you were saying, rather than going for something more contemporary. Um, but by doing that, and you sort of approached the characters, it gave it more of authenticity because they seemed like genuine and real. They didn't seem like some sort of cliche you would get, you know, in a typical, uh, you know, stereotypical horror. Um, but um, when you were writing, um, sorry, the, uh, sorry, when you were casting the film, you know, um, you know, how did you come across, you know, the actors that you eventually uh, cast in the roles? Because I thought the likes of uh, the, the actor who played Father John was terrific and even the Mother Superior, there's something really sinister to it, but there's a genuine quality to her as well. Well, as I say, I'd done theatre for a long time. So I had a lot of theatre contact, contacts and yeah. pretty much all of those actors came from that. We did have auditions, but the actors that were cast were all people that I either had seen in someone else's production or that were in one of, um, actually none of them were in one of mine, but my husband is a music director of theatre as well. And uh, Kieran Flynn, who plays John, he was in a couple of productions that my husband did music for, so I'd seen him perform. And um, Helena was in a couple of productions that he did music for as well. Lawler is just a legend on the scene. Everybody knows Lawler. He's such mm -hmm. a great actor. Yeah. And um, I think we have some, uh, I think we, we have the biggest pool of well-trained actors in, uh, in Ireland that are theatre actors because the film scene is so nascent and pretty young. It's only in the past 15 or so years that Northern Irish film has really picked up because we didn't have the infrastructure previous to that. There were films, but we didn't have the, the um, amount of content that we have now. So it's taken a while for that to really take off. But we have really, we have really top drawer, uh, well-trained theatre actors and have had for a long time. So it seemed like a sensible place to look as well, rather than um, going straight to film experience. And it was important that uh, and also our really good film actors tend to go to London or LA because that's where the money is as well. Um, we, do, we do have loads of really undiscovered talent here too, but I felt for this one, we need to shoot so quick and everything. I wanted, I wanted old hands that I knew could do the job. And um, in some ways, the kind of acting that you need, particularly with The Devil's Doorway, because so much of it is about character rather than the situation. Uh, particularly in terms of Lawler's character, uh, Father Thomas. It needed a, a very specific, subtle type of acting that wasn't quite cinema acting, wasn't quite theatre acting, but that needed someone who had um, enough experience to be able to find that middle ground nuance. I wanted him to feel like literally a real person. I didn't want him to do... Uh, really beautiful cinematic acting that you get where there's very subtle things portrayed with expression and so on because we're not going to be the camera's not going to be picking those out those things purposefully because it needs to feel like a documentary so I wanted someone who could actually perform as though they're in a documentary which yeah. is seems fairly straightforward but it's actually quite a hard space to find as an actor and uh, as I say we did auditions we actually auditioned a lot of people for Lawler Lawler's part and um, Lawler came to me I had, I knew who Lola was, of course. Uh, he didn't come in through the agents or that process. Uh, he sent me an email because one of his friends had auditioned for it and had said to Lola, you should audition for this. And he read the script and he liked it and he emailed me and he said, uh, I want to audition for this. So it wasn't even in the official audition process. He came down to my office at like seven o'clock and just, just did it. And it was just so perfect. And, uh, that was that. Um, the, the actress who played Kathleen was originally cast as a different actress who had a clash and had to pull out uh, days before the shoot. So um, Kathleen, played by Lauren Cole, was auditioned on the set while we were already shooting. So the first week, we shot for two weeks. The first week, we shot all of the stuff that didn't have Kathleen and the second week, we shot all the stuff that did have Kathleen. And um, Lauren was not there the first week. I had, mm -hmm. I had actresses come on set at like nine o'clock at night and just me and them and that spooky building, no lights around the candle. <laughs> Didn't even have electricity, it was so weird. But that's where we did the 
uh, auditions and it was just me and her and then one or two other actresses on different nights and uh, yeah so it was an unusual audition process casting process mostly because the time frame was so concentrated usually you have more than four months to completely make a film you know but in this case it was very concentrated yeah and that's just uh, touching on another thing, uh, you know, with the way you said you had to go by candlelight sometimes. It's just uh, when I was researching in terms of how you shot the film, you know, I, I think you alluded to it that you used a 16 millimeter camera and there's minimal use of CGI threaded. And I think that's something that really sets it apart from other found footage films. It's, it, you know, it lends the authenticity of the whole thing. Uh, but, you know, what was your experience of, you know, taking that approach to you know, the film rather than, you know, everything seems to be digital these days or there's very little in terms of actual film use? Well, first of all, I should say that while we didn't have these, the house that we shot in, we shot in two locations, uh, Craig Avon House was the primary location and it didn't have electricity, but we did have generators, you know, because obviously we needed that. But um, what's the other thing? Uh, oh, about the, about film and why we use film. Yes. Okay. So, Given that this was going to be a found footage film set in that time period, uh, and given that I had most of the stuff that I had shot previously had been on film, uh, I'd shot quite a lot of stuff on eight, eight millimeter film. I'd also shot some 35 millimeter, and then my dad had, had his old 16 mil as well. Um, I was comfortable with that medium, and it felt like it had to be that if we're gonna do it in this period, it was really important to the executives as well, that it felt like, not that we were trying to actually sell it as a real document in the way that Blair Witch was sold, but that you allowed the audience to have that suspension of disbelief. So it needed to feel like a real document. And to do that, it needed to be filmed. So of course, money people will always throw their hands up if a director says, I want to shoot it in a film, because it seems like a really narcissistic thing to say. But in this case, I genuinely felt like we really had to. So we shot some test footage on film and some digitally to show them the textural difference. And they agreed that it did really help to sell it more. Um, we didn't shoot the entire film on uh, film. We shot um, portions of film and portions on digital, especially if it, ha if it needed some kind of post-production. It was just a, the compromise that we came to. But once you had shot it, all the daylight stuff, particularly on film, you'd, you'd sold it and then spend time in the grade to match them all up. Um, for me, it was simply a case of, if you want something that feels like a genuine document, which was something that they wanted before I was even attached, then this is how you have to do it. And uh, also, I felt that this was gonna help them to sell it as well, because as I say, you go to Amazon Prime or you go to Shutter or whatever, and there's all these found footage horror films and you're like, how am I supposed to pick out which ones are good or not? Because they all kind of look the same when you just look at the poster or you just look at the trailer. And this needed to aesthetically sit outside of that. So being period and being film, it instantly just feels like a different type of film, even though it's found footage, it doesn't feel like the same thing again. Yeah, well, well, that's the thing about found footage. Usually it's, for me, it's like the black sheep of the horror genre. Usually when I, I see the words found footage, I'm like, oh no, that just puts me off it completely. But, you know, when I actually, you know, sat and I watched The Devil's Story, it just completely changed my mind and I absolutely, you know, I, lo I loved it, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. And uh, for me, it, it sort of stemmed from the characters and, you know, it sort of reminded me, uh, you know, especially with the Father Thomas character, it sort of reminded me of, you know, Father Mark in, or not Father Mark, Father Carr, sorry, in The Exorcist, you know, he has that sort of uh, conflict within his faith, you know, he's a God-fearing man, but he doesn't trust the institutions that he's supposed to be representing in a, uh, in a sense. So um, I'm sort of just going to ask, you know, um, you know, was that sort, sort of one of the themes that you really want to get across in terms of, you know, the church and, you know, their position within the whole uh, Magdalene Laundrie's uh, controversy in that? Yeah, um, it really was important. I felt that I didn't want to make this just a priests are bad thing or nuns are bad mm -hmm. thing. I want I, Because every terrible thing that happens is very complex and yeah. it's not, uh, we kind of give ourselves an easy out by acting as though there are just villains and good people. There aren't. 
there everybody has, is layered and uh, there's no such thing i don't i don't like it in uh films when we have a clear unless it's like fun like halloween or something yeah. i don't like having a clear villain who's not a complex person who you know um, has motivations and reasons for what they do i want to know why people do bad things so the devil story also this period when we were making it was also when my dad died so he got his diagnosis um in the same month actually that i first met martin about the film and then he died just before we went into post-production so he had a very contracted illness and he was very suddenly gone and my dad was always uh he's an irish man he spoke irish uh, you know, we're from the South originally. That's where I was raised. And um, Ireland was really important to him. Our whole lives, he would never go on holiday. He would never get in a plane and go somewhere. He would say, people come all over the world to go to Ireland. Why would we go somewhere else? So he was really uh, very proud of being Irish. And he also was a Catholic, but I know that he struggled with his faith in the back of everything that happened in Ireland with the Magdalene laundries and with uh, reformatories and... Uh, clerical abuse and I know that he felt cons conflicted by the shame and the pride that he had for Ireland which is so enmeshed with Catholicism so I guess that was kind of forefront on my mind when I was writing uh, Father Thomas's um, kind of introspective uh, pieces when he's saying to John uh, I believe in God but you won't find God here I was trying to pick apart that conundrum at the heart of my father where it was like he believed in God but he also felt so betrayed by the church mm. and I guess that was I felt that was an interesting thing to explore that yeah. you'd be a priest um, and that you would have joined the priesthood because you believed in God and you wanted to work for the higher thing the elevated thing but actually you're always being dragged down to the bestial to to cruelty and, and abuse and worse than God is something, I don't believe in, in God, you know, I'm uh, definitely an atheist, but God, the idea of God is something elevated above humans. And then you've God, you humans, and then you have bestial behavior. And it seems like the church was constantly reverting to bestial behavior, which was worse than human, never mind as good as God. So I thought that was an interesting conundrum at the heart of uh, the whole Magdalene Laundry controversy, how it happened in the first place how people got this inflated sense of their own importance, that they felt that they could hide these things and uh, still feel like they were somehow good people. So that's yeah. basically what it's about. Yeah, and you even see that to today with you know, that recent news story of uh, you know the closing of the mother and uh, baby records down south. Exactly. Um, so in a way that's sort of, uh, you know, it keeps it current, you know, the, the film in the, and it, it keeps the uh, you know the film fresh in that sort of sense, um, and it also seems to have had a bit of another resurgence lately. You know, with it, uh, you know, recent you know as it's been shown more recently on film four, and it's been made available on all four. Um, you know, do, do you think? You know, have you had any experiences where you know uh, people from say other parts of the world have you know spoken to you about the film, and it's just rang true to them because. It, it does seem like a very Irish thing, you know, the whole Magdalene Laundries controversy in that. And, um, you know, it, it is, um, you know, it, the film itself feels very distinctly Irish, but there are universal themes, obviously, and um, issues within it. But how's the sort of international reaction been towards the film? Well, it's a, that's a funny one, actually, because um, it's... It's home ended up being, for the most part, uh, America is where most people saw it, where most people engaged with it, where I did most of the uh, film festival circuit, where it was released in theatres as well um, in America and where I would get the most kind of communication from people, you know. But at the same time, there were a lot of Americans who didn't get, even if they liked the film, didn't actually know that Magdalene Laundries were a real, real thing. Yeah. Right? you know, uh, just didn't have that historical context, but they enjoyed the film anyway. They just thought I made that up. Like, you know, uh, they didn't know that these were real places that actually existed. They just thought this is an evil convent, you know, rather than this was yeah. a systemic thing. And um, so, but at the same time, that's where I feel like I'm most welcomed with the film and have been from the beginning. Like the first time anybody saw it that wasn't part of the production was uh, 
at the Seattle Film Festival um, in 2018. And when I was going to the screening, uh, so the festival sent a guy to pick you up and take you. So he works for the festival, he knows everything that's going on. And he's driving me down to the festival. And um, I saw this big, massive queue of people going past the theater down the street, around the corner. And I just thought, oh, there must be like a big gig on tonight or something, you know. And he said, all those people are queuing for your movie, you know. It sold out. And I was like, what? I couldn't believe it. I know. <laughs> Um, I didn't think for a second that people would as many there was a 4,000 seat theater and I had no I had no understanding that it would be that it would generate that much interest and um, people really talked to it over there um, then countries that have if they're not Irish countries South America it, it has done really well uh, Spain so countries that have uh, that are heavily Catholic they on they get it in the in that in that specific way where they understand that element of it. Um, but I think, uh, strangely, America has been where it's been most welcomed. Mm, that's great. If well, not as understood, yeah. Oh yeah, and maybe not as understood as such, but I suppose you gave them an education in a way with, you know, letting them know about the Magdalene laundries, but uh, sort of moving away from the devil's doorway. Um, you know, like I said at the start of our conversation, you know, you were a recent recipient of the uh, Academy Gold Fellowship Award uh, grant for women, and that sort of led to you, um, you know, being invited to this year's Oscars. So, can you just, you know, let us know sort of uh, what that experience was like? Well, I'm still Academy uh, Gold yeah. Fellowship holder because it lasts for a year, and then when because there are a bunch of stuff that you do, it's kind of like being a beauty queen. You have to do a lot of things, <laughs> you know. Uh, it lasts for a year, but because of the coronavirus, it's been extended because I actually didn't get to do anything apart from the Oscars. That was February and then lockdown came up March or April. Mm -hmm. um, so basically it is a program that the uh, Academy initiated a few years ago to, I think I was the second year, so it's quite new. Um, it's to try to address the recurrent problem every year at the Oscars where uh, female directors don't get, don't get an Oscar basically ever mm -hmm. in like 90 years. So they set up this to elevate um, women that have been voted for by female members of the academy. So um, it's just a kind of way of, of lifting you up and getting people to pay attention to you, I guess. But it's, it's really nice because you have been voted in by members of the academy. Um, they all get to choose who's going to be the, the gold fellowship holder. And it means a lot to know that they chose me in this instance. So yeah. at, and as to what it entails, I've had very little because of uh, COVID. Um, I was supposed to be in LA for a period this year and there were sort of things that I would be part of over there that I would do or people that I would meet and none of that really happened because of coronavirus, but hopefully next year when restrictions lift a bit. Well, definitely fingers crossed for you in that. But the Oscars was fun, I mean, I guess. What's that, sorry? <laughs> I said the Oscars was fun, I guess. It was like, oh yeah, <laughs> I can only weird, imagine. Uh, kind of kind of a slog in a way it's like it's a very long day right um, i think people don't the thing the major thing that i took from it was i mean it was really cool to be there and just kind of people watching stuff but uh and to wear a nice frock and all that kind of thing was nice um which i don't do very much and all the nibbles and everything all that's lovely uh the things that they give you but um it was seeing how much work goes into this from right so for example you're on the red carpet and all the people see at home is all the the ladies on the carpet and their frocks and the men and their tuxedos and it all looks very stage managed and it is stage managed and um i would see uh, i won't name any names but you'd see ex famous person i uh, would stand and take a bunch of photos look completely serene and just look beautiful and very serene taking all the photos taking all the photos and then as soon as the cameras stop they're like their whole face changes because it, it's almost like they're an athlete. It's not that they yeah. become big at all. It's like it's work. They take their shoes off. They're like go, moving on to the next thing. It's very like, um, I got that feeling from it. It was almost like watching a race. Yeah. And then, then they finish at the end and they move on to the next thing, you know? So it's a long day. It's like 12 hours or something. Wow. It's really exhausting. But I mean, like, I'm glad I did it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It sounds like an, <laughs> sounds like an experience to say the least. Um, and just uh, sort of going back to your shorts, uh, I recently watched uh, another one of your shorts called I Exam that was related to Hulu, I believe. Uh, how did that sort of come together for you? 
Well, that was Disney. Um, every year they make a series of micro shorts in the run up to Halloween and they release them in the run up to Halloween on Hulu. Uh, they're kind of family friendly uh, shorts that Disney, Disney 20th Century Fox make together. So that came about because, well, basically COVID happened. Nobody was shooting anything. I was supposed to be shooting uh, something else this year and everything got shut down. At some point during the summer, Jack Tarling, the producer of that, who also uh, produced God's Own Country, if you remember that movie. Oh, yeah. So Jack, I already knew, um, he got in touch and said, uh, I've written this little short film. I'm going to submit it to this Disney thing. Would you be interested in doing it? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? Like, it would be, you get to shoot something under these conditions where oh, yeah. you might get anything otherwise. So I said, yeah, why not? It's, it seems fun. And um, we pitched to Disney and then some weeks later or some months later, whatever, found out that they gave it the green light and then shot it. And that, that was that. But yeah. It was fun. To well, for someone who's doing another eye test soon, it's put me off it. So thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I suppose then, uh, you know, going back to what you were saying, sort of about, uh, you know, your experience uh, with the Academy, you know, what do you think in terms of, uh, you know, well, women filmmakers what's their sort of future even in the world of horror as such because you know in recent years you know we've had yourself with the devil's doorway jennifer kent with the babadook and um i believe karen kusama is about to do a version of dracula as well so you know it, it there definitely is seems to be a, a lot more drive uh for more female directors within the genre because the genre itself is just something that you know when you think of females within it you just think screen queen and that's it but it's very refreshing and you know just to have this sort of you know drive now towards more women rather than in front of the camera than behind the camera so what, what do you think the future lies within you know women having that representation more well i think it's a natural place for it to go mm -hmm. um when I fell in love with horror films, as I said, I was like seven years old. I was in the eighties. And uh, at that time there was an assumption that men, particularly young, young men were the driving force, uh, were, were the target audience for horror films. There was an assumption that men were the driving force behind what videos families would rent or what movies they would go to see at the cinema or what you would go to see on a date and that teenage boys were basically the ones who loved horror. And um, because of that, that's why I used to have silly rules, like you have to see boobs at least twice or something like this. Yeah. Horror film, which you'll notice you don't. I uh, the women are the ones who are primarily uh, watching horror films. There's a far bigger female audience for horror than they used to think there was. And this was a great surprise. So women have always loved horror. Um, I think it's quite natural that given that women are, are male violence is a big problem in society. That's, there's a reason why every serial killer pretty much and uh, every bad guy in a horror film is a man because of course, not all men, but if there's going to be someone enacting violence, it's usually a man and a woman is usually the victim. So women from childhood have had to navigate this. And I think a fascination with horror is part, part, a safe way of, of dipping your toe into fear and figuring out your physiological response to fear. So I'm pretty sure that since caveman times, women have been interested in scary stories and spooky content. We also know that women are the primary audience for true crime podcasts, novels, stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I think um, Hollywood does what it does, which is it adjusts to the market. And it knows now this is the market. So it started to focus more on women. And then just because it's, I mean, it's the year 2020, <laughs> there's a less of a feeling that women just can't do it somehow or that they're naturally predisposed against anything scary. I think there's more of an understanding that women just aren't all kittens and candy floss, you know that uh, we really do like dark content too, and also that we're 52% of the population. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of stories to tell that have never been told, and I think that's in, to everyone's benefit. I mean, I was talking to someone about this yesterday. I was on a panel of uh, women horror filmmakers, and um, 
or her, so one of the women said that her boyfriend says that he won't watch film if he knows a woman has made it. And I think that is so sad for him. We've, I mean, like I loved Indiana Jones when I was a kid. I yeah. loved the Ghostbusters. Um, I was able to put myself into the shoes of all of these male protagonists and I didn't suffer because of it. I was, my life was enriched. And I think you impoverish yourself if you cut off 52% of the population's perspective on life. It's just you're missing out, you know, like there's so much good stuff out there that women have made. And um, I think it's an inevitable progression, but we still have a long way to go. I think it's 5% of horror films are made by women, even now. Yeah. And I feel like we all know each other. I know so many of them. Um, we have direct or indirect links. And uh, that's because there, there's a handful of us, but I'm sure that that's just going to grow in time and as people cop on a bit more yeah. and stop not watching films that women made. I know. It's great that this sort of narrow view is becoming more wide and uh, it'll continue to grow wider. Um, but yeah, sort of just sort of drawing things to a bit of a close here, you know, uh, what's the sort of future life for yourself? Have you any sort of projects in the pipeline at the minute that you can talk about or anything like that? Um, yeah, I've, I've always got a load of plates spinning because that is mm -hmm. the life for a writer director. It's just what you do. Um, a film that I wrote for someone else is actually uh, shooting on Monday because um, I don't always shoot everything I write myself. Um, An and interesting kind of loop back to uh, when I said I was seven and I saw Nightmare on Elm Street and I thought, oh my God, I'd love to, I'd love to know how to do that, how to make a world like that. Um, one of the producers I'm working with currently and also who was my guest at the Academy Awards is Marianne Madalana, who produced a... Uh, most of Wes Craven's films, who did the whole Scream franchise, and uh, Nightmare on Elm, which worked in Nightmare on Elm Street, all that stuff. And um, I'm writing something for her, a uh, thriller. Wow. Uh, I've got um, quite a few stuff. I've got a number of projects that are in LA, some that are in London. Um, I've got one with Fantastic Films in Dublin, so they just did Bavarian. Uh, yeah. So they're kind of like Ireland's probably premier uh, genre company and I'm working on something for them that's funded by Screen Ireland. Uh, I'm working on something for the BFI. Um, Northern Ireland Screen have always been really supportive of me as well. And then as I say, independent projects uh, and connections over in Los Angeles. So a lot of stuff. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're very busy, you know, given the circumstances. <laughs> yes. Um, so I suppose just one last thing to close things off, uh, just seeing as the time of year we're in Halloween night, what are you watching? I'm kind of, I'm a funny one like this because I'm sort of, uh, I have my own little routines and traditions. So there's one thing that I absolutely have to watch on Halloween and that is Ghostwatch. I watch yeah. Ghostwatch every Halloween. I love it. I can't get enough of it. Only on Halloween though. And um, I just think it's so good. And of course that was a bit of, that was something I was, that was in my head when I was making The Devil's Doorway too. And uh, I've been really lucky to kind of get to know Stephen Bogue a little bit um, in recent years as well, who wrote Ghostwatch. Uh, I really love Trick or Treat. Um, oh yes, the anthology. I, that, yeah, that is, mm -hmm. the, that is the premier Halloween movie. It's just the right exact sweet spot for Halloween tone for me. Mm -hmm. so I'll probably watch those two. And then, I don't know, it's maybe something else. We'll see how it goes. Well, I'd actually recommend to you as well, if you're into Halloween anthologies, I don't know if you've seen it or not yet. It's on Shudder, um, the Mortuary Collection with Clancy Brown. I haven't seen it yet. Yes, that's, I'll... yes, give it a go because it's quite similar to Trick or Treat. So it might be a good watch for the time of year. But um, yeah, that's pretty much everything then, uh, Ashlyn. Thank you very much for uh, taking time to speak to me then this evening. Well, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. It was nice to chat to you. Best luck with the rest of the festival. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, that's not much else to say. But uh, again, thank you. And uh, that's it. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs>